Hello and welcome back, everybody, to the Club Metaverse podcast. Today we are joined by Professor Rajendra Gupta. Am I saying that correctly, sir? That's correct. All right, cool. Uh, professor Rajendra Gupta is uh, um, a professor of, 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 of uh, physics at the University of, of Ottawa, correct? That's correct. Awesome. So, you know, obviously you've been you've been in the news recently for some uh, papers that you've written that to me as a kind of, uh, uh, what's the right word for it? Um, as a fan, maybe fan is a good word for it, as an enthusiast of of the world of physics and, and science, but specifically physics and astrophysics, you know, the stuff that you've written has kind of destroyed my brain. And, and like, you know, everything that I thought I kind of finally felt comfortable with the vastness of the universe, I could put some numbers around it and some scaling around it. Um, you know, your paper has completely shattered that. So before we get too deep into that, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. How how did you sort of fall in love with physics? I fall in love in physics when I was a child. Mm. Not really a child, but I mean, it's very early stage of my student. I really didn't do very well in physics initially. Mm. But then when I fell in love with this, then that's what that's the way to go. You know, once I start understanding, initially I didn't understand it. That was the big problem. Once I, I start to understand it and then I start enjoying it. And that's the way my life got into physics. And, and do, you, do you remember that one thing that crystallized for you in your mind that you said, OK, now I'm starting to understand it. Do you remember what that thing was? that crystallized yes. for you? Yes, I know that very well because my professor or teacher who was teaching me uh, a light that we used to call, in that light there was a chapter on polarization. Mm. So I had, I was not a very good student, so I was somehow trying to catch up things and reading on my own at home. And I thought I was able to understand and I had read this chapter also polarization ahead of it. And this guy comes and says, this, now you are coming to the most difficult subject of uh, this course. I said, I do understand it. Why are you saying more difficult? That's when I realized I'm not really that bad as I was mm -hmm. thinking. And that's launched me into physics. And did you have a background in mathematics or like arithmetic? Did you have like a strong sort of talent for math from, a, for, from an early age? We were giving courses in, in maths, physics, and chemistry. All these things, courses were there. I didn't do very well, but I was okay. I was somehow getting through. So I had understanding of maths, yes. I didn't yeah. score very high, but I was, it was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like for me, uh, that's my issue. I, I absolutely love physics, and I just love what it stands for, and and the history of it, and all the discoveries, and and how physics is like the one thing that every time there's a massive new discovery, the world changes. You know, and, and it's like it's very rare. I mean, there's other things that are like that too, but there's something about the understanding of physics that really is guaranteed to elevate humanity to whatever the next chapter of the story is. Um, so, yeah, so for me, it's, you know, it's a fascinating thing. So can you tell me a little bit more about what you do now? Like sort of kind of what's your day-to-day, -day, um, you know, interest studies? You know, what what are you sort of focused on uh, these days? Oh, my focus is really uh, in teaching astrophysics and cosmology and really 90% of my time, active time in academic life is in research. Mm. Teaching is not that much of a burden because I'm an adjunct professor, so I don't have a whole lot of teaching responsibility. I teach one or two courses, one course a semester or something like that. So mm. a lot of spare time to do research. And where is your field of research focused in? Uh, mainly in the cosmology part of it. But astrophysics and cosmology are in some way interrelated. Mm. So I teach astrophysics, I do research in cosmology, I have written papers in astrophysics as well. 
but I don't see there is major boundary between the two. You know. And, and what is the kind of traditional delineation between the two fields? Uh, cosmology deals with the universe as a whole, mm. whereas astrophysics focuses on the objects in the universe. Mm. like stars, galaxies, and all formation of those, and how they live and die, those kind of things. And, and did you, in your research, um, you came up with this, you know, with this paper, and, I, and, and I'd love to get into that, but maybe I think it'd be useful for my audience who maybe isn't as into it as I am, um, the kind of, the current understanding of the age of the universe, as I understand it, has been determined by, you know, number one or one of those things, you know, the, the, the cosmic background radiation, you know, that was discovered in Princeton, you know, many years ago, um, and also the study of meteorites um, in the solar system that kind of gave us, oh, actually, that's more for the for the age of the Earth. I'm sorry, I'm confusing the two things. But, but, but the cosmic background radiation was really the one key element that kind of lets us know where the outer boundary of the Big Bang is. And we can sort of determine, okay, 14.6 billion years ago is where we can, you know, that's like like the redshift and the light. And how, how did you kind of make the leap beyond that sort of traditional understanding to the field of study that you're in now, where you're thinking perhaps it's a little bit different or a lot different? Our traditional study, originally, the age of the universe was determined by the Hubble constant mm. and the cosmological equations which uh, uh, determine the Hubble constant. But the and why, what happens when the Hubble Space Telescope was launched? I should go back a little bit. Yeah, Before yeah, please, Hubble please. This telescope was launched the age of the universe was uncertain between seven and 20 billion years. People were not sure what it is. And it was because of the uncertainty in the measurement of the Hubble constant. But once uh, the and, Hubble... And, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but the Hubble constant is also sometimes referred to as, as, as dark energy or dark matter. It's the, it's the constant that Einstein also talked about right or this is a different thing you know, Hubble constant is tells us by measuring the redshift of the galaxies mm. how fast they are receding from us mm. the, the velocity is proportional to the distance and the proportionality constant is the Hubble constant I see so I'm sorry continue yeah so that Hubble constant then if you know how fast galaxies are receding now, then you can extrapolate that from what point they are receding. If you know the rate of their recession, of how fast they are receding, then you can extrapolate it to the point when to a level where you can say, okay, this is where it started and it is receding at this rate. Now, if you can measure over time that maybe it was receding not as fast in the past and now it is moving faster, then that determination, that will change the determination of the age. So Hubble, uh, the, when the Hubble telescope, when it was launched, then Hubble telescope determined that this thing is really speeding faster and faster rather than slowing down. Previously, people thought it was really slowing down over time. Because if it started from Big Bang, then eventually the gravitational force, attractive force will slow the expansion down. Mm. As a result, it should show the slowing down. But what happened when Hubble Space Telescope was launched, they found no, it is not slowing down, it's accelerating. Mm. That's where Einstein's cosmological constant came in. Mm. What is causing it to accelerate? where from that energy is coming. That's when the Einstein cosmological constant was reinvented, I would say, because mm. it was rejected at one point. Einstein himself rejected it. 
after he introduced it, then he said that it was his greatest blunder mm. to use it. <laughs> but somehow it was it was removed and it was again Hubble observation could not be explained without it. Wow. So that's the existence of this. So the model was developed then based on this constant, plus there were other issues with that, that what is causing certain galactic rotational curves, which are showing that the mass of the galaxy is in is increasing. Even in the region where there is no light, there is some mass there where this mass comes from. So they call it dark matter. The mass, it must be dark. It is gravitationally there, but observationally it is not there in, in terms of light. So that's the dark matter. That's why it is called cosmological constant called lambda, lambda cold dark matter yeah. mm. model. And that model then explain a lot of things which Hubble telescope was observing and that's why it mean like cosmic microwave background you said that was the main thing that confirmed a lot of things which were uh, the model provided but my, by the way cos, uh, Planck constant is Planck this was Planck Hubble, Hubble telescope and there was a Planck telescope which observed the cosmic microwave background mm. yeah. and it found the isotropy highly isotropic uh, microwave background but there was minor anisotropy on that of the order of about one part or ten part in a million and these iso anisotropies they try to correlate those things and find what causes this anisotropy and that gave a lot of other data, including the age of the universe. But mm -hmm. mind it, it is model dependent. That age determination was already based on model dependence. So data itself, when it is interpreted, it is somewhat model dependent. So the so based on the data at the time collected by the Hubble telescope, the Planck telescope. Um, using the Hubble constant and the Einstein uh, cosmological constant, given all that data equals the 14.6 billion years that we've all kind of known and loved for the last like 15, 20 years or whatever it is. But what, as I understand it, is new data is introduced, which is the, you know, the, the, the heart and blood of science is when new data is introduced to an understanding, it tends to have consequences of that understanding um that there's there's been um stuff in the web telescope that has introduced potentially new data that can affect this equation to understand the age of the universe correct is that is that where some of this stuff is coming from that's correct that is correct like the way hubble telescope changed from no cosmological constant to bring in the cosmological constant and essentially crystallize the physics of that time in a way that, okay, now there are not so many uncertainties. We can talk about physics in real terms. The same kind of thing appears to be happening due to the launch of the Webb, um, James Webb Space Telescope. Mm. It is again changing our paradigm at this point. And a lot of observations which we are having are not readily explainable without stretching the physics quite a bit. We are not able to explain those things. And that's where there's a need for some revision of the model. Because, you know, first of all, this is why I'm so glad to be speaking with you because I've seen um, news clippings in the, you know, in, in a few of the science periodicals that I read and you know, social media and stuff about finding, you know, galaxies that aren't moving as fast as they should or or planets that are, or suns, I'm sorry, that uh, are going from type one to type two that are way older than we thought they would be, which would, which would mean that if it takes like X number of billion years to get from type one to type two or whatever that number is, 
that it wouldn't make sense if the if the solar if the universe is only 14.6 billion years so it's good to speak to somebody who's actually seeing the data because i can't tell if it's clickbait or if it's like fake news or if somebody's just making it up because people just like to say things you know to like make things easy to click on but you've seen data that sh that that creates like inexplicable you know findings from from the uh, from the web telescope indeed indeed and that is the ground of my paper actually i should say in i was working on this for some time i had my own theory on this which is based on the the varying the physical constants are not true constant and that was paul dirac mm. in 1937 he said that gravitational constant, especially, and the fine structure constant, they are evolutionary. They are mm -hmm. not really constant. As the universe expands, these constants change very slowly. So you can only perceive them on cosmological time if you can at all. So that idea was, by the way, I met Paul Dirac on his 70th birthday. In oh, Italy wow. At one time. So that was something I got very interested in and intrigued by that. And I developed the model, and I've been working on that since about 2018 or 19, not too long ago. Mm. Uh, and that way, I, I found that that model can explain certain things better. But there were flaws in that model. I myself saw there were, there were some flaws. And then this is what I was developing, trying to correct the flaws in that model. When James Webb telescopes bombshell came, that's when I started thinking maybe model that model is not enough. There's something else I thought very early in my career, maybe I have to bring that into uh, this equation. So one thing is the evolving physical constants. And another thing I found in the evolving physical constants, people say, okay, they studied gravitational constant only. They think gravitational constant is studying that alone is very difficult. So we cannot consider simultaneously the varying, varying other constants. But what happens now I found out, and this was also mentioned by some elite uh, other astrophysicists, that if you vary one constant, then other might also vary. And how this, then I worked on it and find in what is the relationship between the variation of these constants, among the variation of these constants. And that was, that means, these constant, which I call coupling constant, or people call coupling constant, they essentially define the interaction energy between different particles, photon, electrons, and all those. Mm -hmm. These coupling constants are variation of this is governed by a single function. Each one is not individually there. There, that means their variations are correlated. Once we, I found that that was a very important thing because that means I don't have to choose the variation of each constant and find how each one is individually varying. If I can find this function, which relates all the uh, variation of all the constants, that will make life much easier. So I just looked into that, derived certain equations starting from general relativity, Friedman equations, and all those kind of things, and I. Found it, it yielded a very simple thing. And then I don't need the uh, cosmological constant. Mm. Everybody hated, but it can live live without that. You can really explain something about, about the universe. Why lambda is there? It creates energy perpetually and it violates the energy conservation laws. Okay. Even what I'm saying variation of this constant, if you strictly look into the energy conservation, there is problem with that. But energy conservation people know very well is a localized effect. It is not at cosmological scale, 
energy is not conserved. In general relativity, at larger scale, cosmological scale, energy is not conserved. So that's okay. That's not the problem. So the, going from there on, then say that model itself fits the observations very well. Mm. But it could not fit the observation. My The model I developed yeah. is called covariant coupling constant model. It can fit other data, but not the James Webb data. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so just I'm sorry, just because I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to make sure that I that I'm understanding a little bit, you know, but enough, right? Um, the the observation that you're using to to make sure that your that your calculations are matching the observation, which observation specifically are you referring to? The most critical one test for any model is the supernovae type 1A data. Mm. which essentially gives the supernovae type 1A data is a standard candle. So it's once you see it somewhere and you observe it and you know from its properties what the luminosity is. So you know it's the standard luminosity and you measure its flux. From there you know how much energy you are receiving and you can then determine the distance from that. And second distance is determined by redshift. So you relate these two and it should fit the observed data. So that is a, a very key thing. If you if any model doesn't meet that criteria, it's not worth pursuing anyway. Mm, so I, I understand. Yeah. So that was the acid test for it. So I did that test. And from my previous model, similar to that, I had done other tests as well. But in this case, I made this test, and then my main focus was, can I explain the James Webb, Webb telescope data? So it couldn't explain that. And, and, and which, which piece of the James Webb telescope data specifically are you referring to? Cosmic Dawn data, the data of the formation of galaxies at the Cosmic Dawn, at the, what they call the reanalyzer reionization stage of the universe. In that one, you know, how could the galaxies be created within half a billion year or less, which are, appears to be almost as mature, as massive as the galaxies which are in our neighborhood. Right, right. And that's where the big disconnect came about and that was the big breaking story that we had one expectation of how long it would take for something like that to 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 be created at that scale and it seemed to not fit our understanding of it right exactly and and that's where my other things comes into picture which is the tired light theory which is the theory used in the steady state model in the last century to say, okay, maybe the galaxies are not, not receding from us, but they are the light in traveling such large distance get tired. I mean, tired means it loses energy. Yeah, the photons lose, lose their energy over very energy over time traveling. Yes. So that was the tired light theory. And by the way, this is the tired light theory I thought of long, long time ago when I was just very young, physicist just and I thought of it, and I wrote to the editor of Astrophysical Journal at that time, who was Chandrasekhar, who later got the Nobel Prize. I wrote to him. I didn't know what it was. I was just saying, okay, this terminal velocity of photon in a cosmic fluid. So maybe that's what that is causing this kind of problem. I wrote to him. He said, yeah, tired light theory is just a tired light theory. So, but then I, was, I started working on other things, you know. Mm. And this starlight theory, then I said, all right, what do I do with this? Previously in 2018, I had worked with the, the lambda CDM model, combined it with the tired light, and I got some result. I sent it to Jim Peeble, who is, you know, he's the famous CMB guy who got Nobel Prize in 2019. He wrote back to me, this is a new idea. But I don't think it can explain the CMB uh, on its own. Tired light cannot. So with the combined one, you have to see whether it can explain or not. Mm. 
So this is where I left it there. At that point, I started working covering coupling constant thing. Now, when I heard about James Webb telescope, I said, let me combine with the covariant coupling constant, lambda CDM model, and everything, the starlight effect, and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So I tried not just in my model, but also in lambda CDM model. This is in the paper. It is, everything is presented in the paper. So I showed that, that if we use the lambda CDM model, we don't cannot fit the observed data. Even lambda CDM model combined with tired light does not explain the data. So the just so I make sure I'm understanding, and thank you for being so clear. You can tell you're a very good professor because even I'm understanding this stuff. But you're saying that the 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 current observable data from the James Webb telescope, right? If you use the existing theories that we have to explain all of these things, it doesn't add up with the new observable data. Yes, that's right. I mean, that's, I mean, that's so, when you know you got something, right? <laughs> but not only that, even if I take the existing Lambda CDM model and combine it with the tired light theory, it is still cannot explain that. Right, right. So, so, so this theory that people were using to kind of band-aid um, the inaccuracies of the observation before this tired light theory that photons lose energy over very vast distances still wouldn't explain these new phenomena that were observed through Webb. Yes, on its own it cannot anyway because it on it on its own it cannot fit the supernovae data. It cannot fit the CMB observation, so it is that's why it was completely rejected. But when we combine it with the the other models like Lambda CDM model, even then that combination or hybrid model, I call it, this hybrid model cannot explain either. And let me let me try to explain how it is. Because mm -hmm. the whether you take a, whether the light is losing energy as a result of tired light effect or expansion of the universe, distance travel is the same. So light is, as it is traveling, it could have effect of the expansion as well as this, but distance travel is the same. So this fact can be used very effectively without introducing additional parameters. Mm. So that is very important because that way I can take any model and hybrid it with the tire light and see whether it works or, or, or not even have tire light. It can just be without that. So this is why I'm saying the lambda CDM model with tired light could not explain, but CCC model, covariant coupling constant model, plus the tired light was successful. But I should add rapidly mm. at this point that this is the beginning. There are a lot of things to be done with this, whether it can explain so many other things or not, CMB, for example, how well it explains CMB. I think CMB will be not very difficult to explain, but there could be other things which may not be. And that's where the community in astronomy will come and challenge this thing. We want them to come back and say, let them shoot it down. This is what I'm right. waiting for. Because, see, this is the beautiful thing that I think a lot of people maybe don't really embrace anymore about science and it's so refreshing hearing it from someone like you, who is like, to you, you only care about the discovery of something that brings you closer to a truth. You don't really care that you're right or wrong. Like, that's irrelevant. It's just using your knowledge to better articulate our natural world is the important thing. And new data influences that. And you welcome the community to test it and try to break it so that you can in fact learn from it you have no like you know personal bias to make sure that it's right and like i think that this is maybe it's a normal thing to you but in our society it's become a very uh, a foreign concept to be wrong right like people hate the idea of being wrong they take it personally and to me it's so important that i think people realize that this is what science is about they almost enjoy 
being wrong. I've had conversations with with uh, with Brian Green, and, and he says that that's one of his favorite things is being wrong, because that that's when you learn. Absolutely, that's the way learning and like peer review, for example. Peer review is a very important process. Some people say, oh, that paper came and they objected for these things and that thing. And now, oh, my, this referee doesn't understand or reviewer doesn't understand what I'm trying to do. I feel the other way. It is a free criticism on my paper. Somebody has seen it carefully and told me what is wrong. If I can't correct it, answer it, that means something is wrong, you throw it out. <laughs> So with, with, with the CMB, the cosmic background radiation, and in my kind of naive understanding of it, I kind of always figured that they were sort of with the redshift and the mathematics of understanding how light travels could, you know, almost measure that it was 13.6 billion light years in the perimeter of the universe. But it's not, that's not the case for, from what I'm hearing from you. It's not, that's not how they measure it. My, my understanding is that the, the, the major thing in that is there are so many peaks in the anisotropy of the radiation. They, they, when they start to correlate the, uh, the uh, various spots they observe in the um, anisotropy, then they find there are certain peaks which are there in the power spectrum. Those peaks relates to, relate to certain things like first peak may relate to one thing, another peak relates to another thing and so on. And overall, then you derive based on the model used, they are again model dependent. I'm just right, right, right. That's the key. Just have this, not only that, today I was listening one uh, Brian Keating, you might know. Yeah, yeah Brian Keating's he been on this show before. Yeah. Right. So he yeah. is, he, his show was there and they were reviewing my paper on, on that show with another astronomer. And he mentioned to me, or not me, I mean, in the show that if there are five parameters, you can fit an elephant. And if you have six parameter, you can make the elephant wag its tail. Mm -hmm. So I feel we have more than five parameters in the CMB whole lot more parameters in there. So yes, you can fit and you are able to get the results of that. You are fitting so many things out of that. You get the results. That's good. I'm not saying that it is wrong. I'm just saying that it has its limitations when you say with such precision mm. that it is so much. They say Planck has Planck satellite has given us this kind of precision cosmology, they say. We get numbers. They are model dependent. That a lot of data is model dependent. We have to be very careful. And I'm not the one who is saying because this is already in the literature. Sure. Yeah. And so given because like just to sort of recap a little bit, the you called it the 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 coupling constant. This is the model that you've been kind of engineering, or this is the one that that you've been using to create your new findings, correct? The coupling constant model is my model. Okay. I, I have devised this model in the way, the form it is. People talked about coupling constant, variation of coupling constant, but they never applied it to, to create a new Friedman equation, which defines the, the expansion of the universe. So that is kind of something very new. And, and it can only be done when you have multiple constant varying the way I have designed it. And using this model, your calculations currently give an estimate that the universe is in fact twice as old as we thought and almost 29 billion years old is, is what you're... No, it is 26.7 billion years instead of 13.7 or 13.8 billion years old. So 26.7, because like I always, and this is kind of going off topic a little bit, but I always had fun thinking, well, if the universe is only 14 billion years old and the planet Earth is 4 billion years old, then, you know, the planet Earth has been around for like almost 25 
you know, whatever percent of the, you know, for, for a big percentage of the existence of reality, it's been around. So that means that humans are probably pretty far advanced, right? Because it took 4 billion years for us to get to where we are now, right? So like, it kind of messes with the math because, you know, everybody loves talking about aliens and are there aliens and there's these spaceships and, and like all this thing. And, and I'm like, well, I find it like for me, the most difficult way for me to get into believing in UFOs and aliens and all that stuff is basically where we are, you know, like it, it took us a very long time to get here. The universe is so vast. Light speed is, is, um, is a very difficult thing to overcome. And so the, you know, the probability of some other race getting here is very low. And I had Dr. Avi Loeb was my last guest. And he found a uh, a meteorite in the uh, you know off the coast of Papua New Guinea that he's uh, examining at Harvard, and he believes potentially has you know alien uh, alloys. He doesn't know for sure yet, but he you know it's his theory. So when people talk about UFOs, I'm like, it's definitely man-made. Number one, and number two, if it's not something we understand, then I think time traveling is probably just as likely as aliens, right? Like. They're both as crazy as each other. Mm -hmm. um, but now when I hear from you, well, wait a minute. Actually, it's 27 billion years old. It kind of broadens the time of, of evolution a little bit for potentially other races. So you're kind of throwing my little fun theory out of whack, Professor, with your, with your new findings. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. So, do, so, so what are the next steps? Like... How do you get something like this confirmed? Is there is there observational data that could confirm your theory? Because it sounds that you already kind of confirmed it through observational data. So what's the next step in, in, in sort of getting it, quote unquote, accepted? I think we have to test it on various things because there are so many ways of creating the items in this universe. There's a physics behind it, and we have to see how that physics changes as a result of covariant coupling constant. That means the coupling constant at the time when the universe was only, say, a billion year, year old is different than here by not a whole lot. It was different by a factor of two or three, but that can change quite a bit. A lot of things can change as a result of that. And that has to, whenever anybody wants to test this model, they have to be careful to not just test it based on partial information. Mm. They should see what is involved in this, the why, why I reached that conclusion, and take it as a whole and test it. And then it is a true test. And, and this is my suggestion, and that has to be a lot of things are in astrophysics and cosmology can be tested with the model. And like, sorry to go backwards a little bit, but can you can you explain to me again just a little bit the coupling constant? It's a combination of the cosmological constant and the Hubble constant. No, no, no. no. Coupling constant is nothing to do with Hubble constant or the cosmological constant. Okay, these oh. are the things which are represent the interaction between the particle. For example, gravitational energy is interaction between different particles. Similarly, electromagnetic interaction is determined by, say, the Planck constant and some other uh, um, interaction between different particles also involve the speed of light, which is, again, another thing between electron and photons and those things, or electron and electron, electron and and protons and similarly there is another coupling constant which relates the energy of a system of particles which is the Boltzmann constant. Mm. So these are the four constants I have considered at that time and because they are related through energy they are the one which I find at least they are the one which are have a same function which determines their variation. And one very important thing I find out when one of my, somebody I communicated, uh, John Hunter in the UK, he pointed me out one very important thing which I want to share. Yeah. That all of these constants, 
which I'm considering, in there, there's a dip. all the constants have certain dimensions, you know, mass, length, time, these kind of things are everywhere in, in these constants. So he, he said the variation of these is proportional to the length component of the constant. So mm -hmm. length dimension is somehow changing. Now the whole universe is expanding. Does it mean the length dimension itself is evolving? And one of the very important thing in the newer model, which I have proposed compared to the older one, was the speed, the, the, the length parameter when it is involved in any of the equation, that has to be functionally evolving as well. Length and these coupling constant must be evolving because length is evolving. That is causing the coupling constant to evolve. So one thing that I'm very curious about is you know, you mentioned all these other constants, all these other constants carry the names of their creators, but your your humility knows no bounds because instead of calling it the Gupta con constant, you call it the coupling constant because you're combining no, some other theories. No, no, they are not my constant. That will be a big error calling it Gupta constant because these are constant which were determined by this. All I'm saying they're evolutionary. Evolutionary making them evolutionary doesn't make them Gupta constants. No, right. so, <laughs> not at all. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, they, they, it is good to have those big names associated to those constants rather than somebody who is lowly on the earth <laughs> trying to make his living. You know. Uh, oh no, that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. So, so basically, the 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 next steps is there increased observational data that you're looking for. Um, like, for example, I had another guest who um, did some work with the cosmic background radiation, a, a female physicist um, out of North Carolina. And her whole theory was uh, that there were multiple Big Bangs and that there's, um, you know, that she predicted where those Big Bangs uh, could be seen in the uh, cosmological in the cosmic background radiation and indeed when they observed the specific uh angles that she was predicting that they would be at her and a group of other physicists indeed they were there right so there's like they they kind of made a prediction and were able to see uh proof of that prediction through observation is your work creating any predictions that could potentially be observed in the future the prediction could only be seen as a what theory says is that the age of the universe is so much. Mm. Now, this has to be confirmed by a lot of other observations because at the moment they are based on very limited observations which I have considered. As this telescope and future space telescopes, ALMA telescopes on Earth, all these things, when they bring more and more data, then we have to see whether this holds any water. You know, mm. my model holds any water or it's just one of those which goes by the side. <laughs> and, and, and for you, personally speaking, if it were to go by the side, you just keep looking for the next thing, right? It's not something that you take personally, right? Like you've been able to, because I think that that's something that sounds so obvious perhaps, but is so foreign to so many people right like and that's the beauty of science that you know if it's wrong you keep moving but mark science cannot be developed by being being personal that is my personal thing and if it doesn't work that means everything else is wrong no i'm more more likely to be wrong scientists true scientists think this way i'm more likely to be wrong than right Amen. That's a beautiful and this thing. This is the way, this is the way, and not only that, in the long run, run every scientist is wrong. <laughs> yeah. Because things are evolving and changing. Absolutely. Even the great Albert Einstein, right? Like he admitted that he was wrong when he actually turned out to be right, and now he might be wrong again, you know. So it's like 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 new data introduces new reality, you know, and it's not a you know, people always say. Oh, science is fact. It's like science is science and facts don't, you know, don't really. It's not the same thing. You know, science is an evolving thing, and the facts change or the data changes. Facts are like historical accounts, and you know, 
this person was born on April 4th. That's a fact. Um, but yeah, no, this is fascinating. So what does the next uh, year kind of look like for you? I think I have to do a lot of work in trying to see how this uh, new theory or whatever model applies to uh, astrophysics and cosmology at large. And, and you mentioned one thing, you know, I know that, you know, you've been very generous with your time, but you mentioned one thing that I want to ask you, um, you know, for people like me that are all, you know, like enthusiasts of physics, but don't really practice it, don't research it, just kind of love hearing about it and love learning about it. You mentioned something uh, which has been the great sort of holy grail of physics, you know, for since I can remember, which is this idea that at cosmological scales, there's a certain set of rules that work extremely well, right? The theory of general relativity. And at the atomic scale, there's a set of rules that work extremely well, quantum theory, but these two rules don't play nice with each other. It sounds to me a little bit like your coupling constant does make these two things play nicer with each other. Did I hear that correct or am I totally off on that? Actually, uh, yes and no. <laughs> okay. Yes, in the sense, in the way I'm applying, it is fine. It is applicable there. But if you see how they apply in the standard model of particle physics, then you have a problem. Mm. Because you're using more the backbone of general relativity than you are the backbone of quantum physics. Exactly, exactly. Quantum physics is only to the extent that we the radiation which we are measuring and it's when it is emitted it has different strength and when it is observed it is different strength but not only we have to be very careful when it is emitted it has different energy level and based on that you are it is emitting when you are observing the energy levels are different so one has to be careful say oh it is higher energy emitting and lower energy it is um, observed. No, it is not that way because your level, your detector and emitter both have changed mm. over time. As a result, there is no difference in these energies at that level. Okay. So this is this is another point which people have to be very careful when mm. interpreting data. Some of my colleagues, I had a lot of this discussion with that, and and they felt they were not very comfortable with this. And and that's a very interesting point. Um, do you feel like, as a whole, people are excited about your findings, or do you feel like people are quick to dismiss it? Because if they're quick to dismiss it, you're probably right, right? If they get excited about it, then maybe who knows? But um, like, like, do you feel that people are taking kind of uh, sides on this sort of discovery? I think, um, uh, Mark, one of the things you have to see, if I have heavy investment in something, I would want to take side unless I'm really proven that it is, it is, um, the person is wrong or the theory is wrong. So the people will keep side, taking side. It always happens. Mm. But eventually there will be some people who are open-minded mm -hmm. and they are going to be looking at it from a different perspective. Even those people who tend to take side, they would still feel compelled to give a reasoning mm -hmm. why it is wrong. And I love to hear that because I this interview which I, I think uh, Brian Keating had uh, taken uh, yesterday or the day before with Alison Kirkpatrick. She's an astronomer at Kansas State University. Mm. Oh, very, I, I thought it was a very good peer review of my paper. Oh, very nice. We had taken this apart very carefully. Certain things they pointed me, pointed out in the talk which were very right, certain points were not, I had could have rebuttal on that. So that's why I wrote to uh, Professor Keating and saying, 
it is a very nice peer review. I'm very happy about this, and I can answer some of your objections and questions. I wrote to him about that. Thing. That's so awesome. This is, this is a process. Let people to criticize. This is now. This my paper is for peer review at large. It is not just given to a, a, a reviewer only. You are That's beautiful. You can review it. Everybody can review yeah, it. Yeah. So so where where can I? I'll I'll put the link in the description of the video. I'd love for people. Um, because I kept looking all, all over the, the web, trying to find stuff. And of course, everybody's just trying to grab the headline, grab the headline. But I would love a chance to actually read your paper. Is there a place that we can go to uh, actually read the paper in its entirety? Uh, I can, I can, can I send it to you in any way? Yeah. You, oh, first of all, I, I, I'd love for you to send it to me, but I'd love for, for the audience to also have the ability to potentially see it if it's public knowledge you know if it's for the public let me see one of the problem is the once it is published in a journal there is a certain limitation mm. i can share individually but i cannot share publicly okay so share it just with me and i promise i won't share with anybody but i am i definitely want to uh, dig more into it because you know even though i'm terrible at math it actually and brian green always tells me this he was like, you're not terrible at math. You're just really bad at arithmetic, you know, because like my math actually isn't, you know, you know, I, I understand the concepts, but I'd love to read it, you know, and, and, and to look through it because, you know, when you recontextualize yourself in the context of your reality, things change, you know, like the way that you observe things change. Like when I was young and I learned that everything we basically know is creative of four fundamental forces. And maybe that's changed now too, but you know, you have gravity and you have electromagnetism and the strong force and the weak force and, and that a combination of these four elements creates everything we know. That's a powerful thing to have an abstract concept of in your brain, you know, and our place in the history of the, of the universe is a very powerful thing as well. So, you know, living my, you know, my adult life thinking that we were X years old or maybe we're Y years old is fascinating, you know, and, and, and it's something that you want to learn more about. Okay. Yes, indeed. Of course. Cool. Very good thinking. Very good. Cool, man. So professor, this has been an absolute honor. You've been so generous with your time. Thank you very much. It, 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 do you have any books out or anything that the audience can maybe go check out or you're just pretty much just a I have many papers on archive because I'm somewhat new. In spite of my age, I'm relatively new in this field. I work on other uh, disciplines of physics before, like plasma physics, controlled thermonuclear fusion. Oh, wow. And, and atomic physics, all those kind of things, you know. So the, I'm, I'm in this because that's what I get paid for. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where the money is. <laughs> yeah, but but so, once so... I retired, I worked at National Research Council of Canada. And once I retired, then I said, now I can do whatever I want to do. So I'm now a <laughs> professor. I have no responsibilities. Right. Any... And now you get to spread your wings and actually yeah. change yeah. change the universe, you know, change our understanding of the universe. I love that. Uh, all right. I have to ask you this. Are you going to go watch Oppenheimer? Are you excited about the movie? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, I would. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm pumped yeah. about seeing Oppenheimer and... Hopefully they go into the Heisenberg Oppenheimer relationship. I haven't seen the movie, so I so 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 I don't know. But it's good that physics is finally getting its own movie. You know, that's right, right, indeed, it is. It is. All right, cool. So this is Professor Rajendra Gupta. I'm Mark Fernandez, Club Metaverse Podcast. Thank you so much, guys, and uh, Professor. Thank you once again for uh, joining me, and I look forward to reading your paper if you if you send it. I, I I'd love to check it out. And if I find that there is a place it can be in a, uh, in a public domain, then I will let you know. All right. That's you. awesome. Thank you All so right. much, sir. Thank Hopefully we'll get it. Me opportunity to be on your. Uh, oh, blog. no, thank you. Uh, the the pleasure is all mine. And if there's more findings and more confirmation of your theory, I'd love to chat with you again in the future, professor. This was very enlightening. Okay. I will keep you informed, Mark. Okay, cool. Thank, thank you. you so much, sir. All right. Bye-bye now. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.